Hello, my darling friends. I hope this finds you all well and happy. I am very sad to miss seeing y'all this week. However, I had to travel home for a family emergency. I didn't want to leave y'all with no video though, so I put together this compilation countdown of all of my favorite spring crafts. I really hope y'all enjoy. Big hugs. Coming in at number 10 is this really fun wallpaper art piece that we made earlier this spring. This one was so much fun and I couldn't believe how easy it was to put together. Here's how we made it. For this project, we are going to need a large canvas. I am using a 30, no, a 20 by 30 canvas here and some wallpaper. This wallpaper that I am using has a pre, it's like pre-glued. So all we have to do is wet it down and we are going to, and this is also a paintable wallpaper. So all we are going to do here is cover our canvas with this really cool patterned wallpaper. It's got a really beautiful like paisley type pattern on it. It's very cottage core. So I just came in with my spray bottle. I don't know if this was the right way to do this, but it was the easiest way for me. And I just really saturated this entire thing with water, made sure the glue was very activated. And then I fold it together in and of itself because that kind of also helps with the activation process. And then I just simply laid it over the top of my canvas. And when I did this part, I wanted to make sure that I had enough wallpaper to wrap my canvas over the edges as well. So when you are cutting your canvas, you want to keep that in mind because I want my, I don't want to have weird raw edges on the canvas. I want my canvas to look the same as the rest of the art piece. I, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I just want my edges to look exactly the same. So I did cut this so that it would completely wrap around the canvas on all four sides. Because of the size of the wallpaper, I did have to cut two pieces to fully cover my canvas. And I did come in with my brayer to just smooth this down and make sure I got a really good adhesion to the canvas to make sure my wallpaper was going to adhere to the canvas really well. Then when it came to matching up my seams, I felt like I was struggling a little bit here. However, once the wallpaper dried and the glue dried and everything dried really well, the seam kind of disappeared, but then when I covered it with the paint, it disappeared a little more. Okay, y'all. So this is where we get to start having some fun. We are going to go ahead and paint this entire piece. And this is where you get to do you and just customize this to your taste and your style. So the look that I was going for here was a little bit of a gradient in color. So I'm just going to come in, spread a little bit of paint across this in a variety of different colors. And then I come in with a large soft brush and just start blending these colors out. was blending the colors. I was really liking how this was looking, but I really did not want a whole lot of that white to show through. So I did blend and then add a lot more paint so that I could get full coverage across this canvas. entire canvas 
covered in our base coats. I am loving the gradient here. I think it is really beautiful. But we need to make some of the texture in this wallpaper pop. So to do that, I'm going to come in with some white antiquing wax. And I'm mostly focusing on the really textured parts of the wallpaper when I apply my my white antiquing wax to do this. I do cover most of the canvas doing this because it's mostly textured. But once I get the white antiquing wax down, I'm going to come in with some dark antiquing wax and really just hone in and focus on the super textured parts of this to make those textural, textural parts pop. Coming in at number nine are these cheerful throw pillows that we made for my bed. When we made these, I was definitely feeling the need for some color in my world. I have been loving these so much. I love these fun, bold colors. So here's how we made them. Alrighty y'all, we are just going to jump right into our first project. We are going to be making pillows today, as you all know, and this first one is going to be, I'm making three of these, and this is just going to be a very simple, straightforward pillow, and we are going to focus on how to sew a zipper in. It is so easy to sew zippers. So many people get intimidated by sewing zippers. I am one of them. I used to, but now I've done it so many times that I'm just used to it. I put zippers in all of my pillows. So the first thing we're going to do is cut your fabric to size. And I have cut mine here at 18 by 18. And of course, you just do you. You customize this to fit your needs. So the first thing we are going to do is get our fabric prepared. So we're going to place right sides together. Now pay attention to your fabric here because if you have a patterned fabric, or a lettered fabric that has a specific up and down, top and bottom, you wanna make sure that you get those pieced together correctly. So all we're going to do now is take this to our sewing machine and we're going to sew in a zipper seam. So we will just be sewing across the bottom of our pillow because you want your zipper to be at the bottom. So here we are at the sewing machine and we are going to just place our fabric into the sewing machine and I am actually sewing this at with a one inch inseam here so that when you open it up it's actually two inches because I like to have lots of room for my zipper and it probably is a little overkill but it's just I like to have that really nice big wide um, zipper seam. One thing to keep in mind here as you're sewing this is when you're doing a zipper seam, especially this method, you want to sew this stitch with a basting stitch so that we can easily open our zipper, open this seam later to reveal our zipper. Now that we have our zipper seam sewn into place, we can go ahead and open up our fabric, flip that seam right side up so it's facing you, and then we're going to go ahead and finger press this down. But then I'm also going to take it to the iron because it is very, very important that you have a nice flat seam here for sewing in your zipper. This step's important. You definitely do not want any wrinkles and you want that seam to be really well pressed open. Once you have everything pressed open, we can start pre preparing this for our zipper. We'll go ahead and get our zipper um, pinned into place. When you are pinning your zipper into place, the most important thing to remember is that you have the right side of your zipper facing down. You want that to be facing into the seam so that when we open up this seam, our zipper is properly revealed. It is important also to pin your zipper down. I'm not a big pinner. I don't pin. I pin very few of my sewing projects, but when it comes to zippers, I definitely want to make sure I am pinning this because you don't want that zipper to move 
at all while you're sewing it in. The other little trick here is that while you're pinning it into place, I just take a, I go a little ways down. You can kind of see what I'm doing here. And then I pin it because I'm making sure that my teeth, the teeth of the zipper are perfectly lined up with the center of that seam. Once we have our zipper completely pinned into place, we can take it to the sewing machine and start sewing the zipper in. And if your zipper is a little bit longer than your project, that is not a problem at all because you can actually cut these. The most important part to remember with that though is you want to cut it at the bottom of the zipper. Not you want to cut it where the zipper stop is, not where the zipper pull is. Okay, so here we are at the sewing machine and I am using a zipper foot. This is also really important. If this is your first time sewing a zipper in and you're not sure what a zipper foot is, it should be labeled with the letter I on your the the foot and that's the, the that is what a zipper foot is it's really helpful to use this because the little skinny peg at the bottom or the foot is it helps guide you with your zipper so I like to line mine up so that the zipper peg is running down the off to the side of my zipper. I really hope this makes sense. I hope you can kind of see what I'm doing here. It was really hard for me to zoom this in super close. I did try, but hopefully you can see um, how I am doing this. And then I just start sewing down and you want to sew this with a really tight stitch. So I sewed mine with a number two stitch, two length stitch, because you really want this zipper to be very well secured and very well held into place. When we come to the end of our zipper where our seam is going to be, this is where we're going to make our own zipper stop, especially if you have to cut your zipper because my stop is getting cut off. Obviously, my zipper's longer than this fabric. So to create my own zipper stop, I am literally just going to turn my fabric here and then I'm going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth multiple times to create a really nice, strong, sturdy stitch. And this will help. This will become our zipper stop at the bottom of our fabric. Okay, so after we get our zipper stop sewn into place, we're going to turn our fabric and start sewing up the other side. Remember as you're doing this to just keep your zipper foot in line properly with your, your zipper. So the edge of that zipper foot should be running along the actual zipper itself and the little peg at the end, I'm not sure what that's called, should be running down our stitch line. And that will do, it should, it's like butted right up against the zipper, which helps keep it into, keep it get a nice good straight stitch. Okay, so now we are approaching the top and obviously we can't sew over that pull. So we're going to stop just short of that zipper pull, do a good back stitch to secure that into place and then flip our fabric one more time, open that zipper just a little bit as much as you can in that seam and then we can go ahead and secure the top part of our zipper into place. This is my absolute favorite part of sewing in zippers, and that is opening our zipper seam that we created with that basting stitch. And if you used a basting stitch, this is gonna open super 
easy. So we're just going to take a seam ripper and it is really a good idea to use a seam ripper with a little bead and the bead goes on the inside and just like that we run it down that seam and we've now opened it up to expose our zipper. And something else I really like to do here is first of all get all those little strings out of the way so that they don't get caught in our zipper and then I do like to open my zipper open and close it just a few times to make sure that everything is working correctly. After testing our zipper a couple of times, we can now go ahead and cut off that excess zipper. And I'm just going to go ahead and cut that right across my raw edge. Okay, y'all, so now it is time to actually close up our pillow. So we're just going to, again, make sure that right sides are together. And this step is very important. Make sure that your zipper is opened at least halfway so that once we close this pillow up, we can easily flip right sides out. If you forget to do that step, you're probably going to have some issues on your hand because it will be almost impossible to open up that zipper to enable you to flip it right side out. So we're going to go ahead and start lining up all of our seams and then we're gonna take it back to the sewing machine and close up our remaining three sides. Okay, y'all, so now that we have our pillow completely closed up, I'm going to come in with some pinking shears and just clean up the edges a little bit. I like to do this step because number one, it eliminates bulk so that when we go to turn this right side out, we get nice, clean seams and clean edges. The other benefit of doing this is it prevents fraying so like over time after you've washed your pillow cover a few times you don't get any fraying and it's going to protect your stitches and keep them really well locked into place just remember that as you're doing this don't cut into any of your stitches Okay, y'all, so now we get to do the big reveal. We're going to turn our pillow cover right sides out, and I like to use my finger to just kind of poke out all the corners, but if you're having a corner that's giving you some troubles and you're having a hard time, you can use like the um, end of a crochet hook or um, an end of the spoon or something. Just don't use anything sharp because you don't want to poke through your fabric. All right, y'all, I'm so excited. We have a really cute pillow cover here. It was so easy to do. I thought this was a very straightforward, easy project, and I actually whipped this up in about 20 minutes per pillow, and I am making three of these, so I mean, it was a little time consuming, but per pillow, it was about 20 to 25 minutes. So now we can go ahead and put our insert in and enjoy our finished project. At number eight, we had a lot of fun styling these shelves in my sitting room for the spring season, so this had to make the countdown. I love to decorate, and these shelves were these shelves are some of my favorite places in this space to style. So here's how we did it. Okay, y'all. So over here on this shelving vignette that I have here. This is pretty much staple pieces that I kind of leave up here all year round and then just add a few touches of the season to each of the empty areas. Christmas time might be the only time I would really 
fully change this up and give it a completely different look. So for now, we're just gonna use these staple pieces and I'm just gonna add some greenery, some potted plants, and maybe just a couple of little nicky knacks. So y'all know me, I'm not a really big nicky knack person, but I do feel like we need to add a little bit of spring, sp spring specific pieces to these shelves. Okay, so up on top of the books, I've just got this cute little greenery piece that I think we'll go ahead and just add, maybe just kind of off to the side a little bit. And then a fun little bowl of eggs to the top of our scale, maybe. And just this simple, very simple green piece. Okay, y'all, so to this little wooden bowl here, I am going to, I didn't really want to fill this with eggs. I love this little wooden bowl. I think it, it's, it just adds a lot of, you know, textures. There's lots of different textures going here, and I love wood, anything wood. So this, I thought it'd be fun to set here, and I didn't really want to fill it with Easter eggs because I've already got kind of a lot of Easter eggs going around. So what I decided to do was I have these really cute, cup and saucer sets that I got from my mother. They actually belong to my grandmother and she passed them down to me and I don't really have a place to leave them out all the time. And, and it's a set of four and each represents the four seasons. So I thought this would be a fun, unique way to display these. I love this particular set because you all know me, I love green. So I'm just gonna set the saucer right in the bowl and then we'll put the cup right on top of it and there, we just have a fun, unique way to display pieces that have sentimental value. Okay, y'all, so to finish off this whole vignette here, this whole shelving, I'm just gonna place a bigger plant here, and I just threw this together using just kind of our same rule of thumb when putting greenery and floral pieces together. So I'm just gonna place this here and I feel like adding a bigger piece here kind of helps balance out this whole entire shelving, all the shelving units. <laughs> I'm not sure what I want to call that there. Okay. Then I've got our little resin bunny, and I think I will just set him here. And then it just kind of gives a little bit of balance. So we've got some Easter, some Easter, and some Easter. Okay, y'all, so I feel like that is looking, this is looking pretty good. I actually really like it. I like how we've kept things very balanced by placing, you know, the greeneries diagonal from one another, the books are diagonal from one another, and our Easter elements are also diagonal from one another. And the bunny, this bunny, I might keep it out for a while just because I think this could carry into throughout the entire spring season, because, you know, bunnies kind of go with spring, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, I think we've got it balanced really well, and all of our photos are at a diagonal. So, that's one thing to keep in mind when you are creating a whole, when you're styling shelves like this, balance things out by putting things on the diagonal. It really makes everything look cohesive and well-balanced. Coming in at number seven are these really fun greenery half orbs that we made to grace my entryway. I love creating floral and greenery arrangements and have really enjoyed these styled on my console table in the entry. These were some of my favorites and definitely needed to make the countdown. So here's how we made them. To create this greenery piece, we are just going to need a few supplies. I'm just using a variety of greenery stems here, stems and picks, and then these half round floral foams and of course some wire cutters. This is going to be a pretty simple project, y'all. When I am creating a greenery piece, I just have a few rules that I like to follow. So because this piece is round, I'm going to start, well I actually follow this rule whether it's round or not. but. The way I start creating my base is I place a few picks in a clock pattern. So I'll place one 
at 12, 3, 6, and 9. And then this gives me like a starting point of how to create this floral piece to make it look very cohesive and balanced. So I will come in after I've placed my first initial foundation pieces, I'm going to come in and just simply start filling this all in. So after I get that initial 12, 3, 6, and 9, then I just come in and start filling in the 1, 2, 4, 5, and so forth and so forth until I get this really nice full foundation on, around the entire circumference of our floral piece here. Because I am building this for the scale that we're displaying on the console table today, I decided to go ahead and bring in the little basket that, you know, hangs from the scale arms. I'm not sure what this, the technical name for this is. That might be a fun tidbit of trivia to look up. <laughs> anyway, I decided to pull it in because I started thinking and realizing that once I get this really full, it might be very hard to get it properly placed onto our scale dish here. So I'm going to go ahead and continue building this or finish building it on the scale basket, scale tray, scale. What do you call these? The scale weights maybe? I'm not even sure. Now I feel like I need to go look that up. <laughs> okay, so to finish building this, I'm just going to start staggering all of my layers and I'm just going to continue building layers all the way around the floral foam here until I get it really nice and full. And as I am building my layers, I do stagger them. So I don't place that second row pieces right on top of where I placed the bottom row, the foundation row, I sort of stagger them offset just a little bit. So I'm going to continue doing this process all the way around this layer by layer until I get it really nice and full. At this point, our greenery piece is looking really, really good. So as I was staggering my layers, you can see here how I started adding in some contrasting greenery pieces. And we do still have just a few small holes at the top, so I'm going to add in some more of those larger pieces that I used to create the base on this. But I really like having the mixed greenery in here. I think it makes for a really beautiful piece. It gives it lots of texture, lots of dimension, and lots of visual interest. Coming in at number six are these delightful spring bunnies that we made together. These were so fun. They make me smile every time I look at them. And I actually took these to my mother. She is not well right now, so that's why I have had to visit, go home for a visit. And she has just loved them. They make her smile just as much. So here's how we made them. Well, we can't have Easter projects without creating a fun, whimsical bunny. So for this piece, we are going to be using this wood cutout that I cut out on our laser cutter. And then I'm going to embellish this with some scrapbook paper. So I'm tracing this onto the scrapbook paper right now. And then I will come in and of course I will cut that out. And then we're going to go ahead and glue this to the to, to our bunny, but we're gonna use a fun method for doing this, and it's something that I've never tried before, so we're gonna be trying this together for the first time. Well, it's the first time for me, anyway. <laughs> Okay, y'all, so we are going to be using some Mod Podge to attach our scrapbook paper to our wooden bunny. But we're gonna do this a little unconventional. We're not going to use the traditional method here. So I'm going to come in with my paintbrush and spread a very liberal coating of this Mod Podge all over our wooden bunny. And I'm paying very close attention here to make sure that I get that Mod Podge clear out to the very edges and that every square inch of this bunny is covered because we want to make sure that our paper gets a very good, strong, secure hold. And I also want to make sure those edges are really held down very well so that none of them peel up. 
So after I get this Mod Podge completely coated onto the bunny, I'm going to let it dry. So you can see here that it's completely dry now. Now we're going to come in and put our paper on top of the bunny. And then to activate that glue, to reactivate it, we're going to heat it. I've seen this done so many times and I've always wanted to try it. So this is kind of fun trying something new. So all I'm doing is coming in with my little mini heat press here and I just start to press down in all the little sections at a time to let that glue get reactivated and then just like that it sticks. It's wonderful. It's like magic. I thought this was so fun and the really best part about this, the coolest part is I did not get a single air bubble. Now that we have our scrap of paper attached to our bunny, I do come around and just sort of checked all of my edges to make sure none of them were going to come up to make sure that they were all glued down very well. But I did have a few areas on this bunny where the scrapbook paper was sort of hanging over the edge because you know it's kind of hard to get it cut precise. So my little trick for eliminating that is to just take your little sanding file here and brush in a downward motion and it will just trim off all that excess paper and in, and then it just makes it look like the scrapbook paper is actually painted onto the wood. You don't have any of those weird edges and everything shapes to itself very well. Our edges are looking really, really good. And y'all, I'm very impressed with how this um, method of Mod Podge worked. I, I love it. I will definitely try it again. Okay, y'all, so now let's move on to actually embellishing our cute little bunny. So the first thing I'm going to do here is cut out a pocket. I wanna create a cute little pouch pocket for, the, for our bunny to hold some carrots and whatnot. And the fabric that I'm using here to do this was a little bit thin, so I'm going to go ahead and cut two pieces and then I will just attach these two pieces together to just make my fabric a little thicker. And this pattern, I created it, I just, um, I created this in Canva and I will have it available for y'all as a free download if you're interested. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the pocket out and I'm also going to cut out some carrots and I'm using two different coordinating fabrics to do this. For the carrots, I'm going to go ahead and draw them on rather than pinning the pattern on. I just thought this might be a little bit easier. And so I'm going to flip my fabric wrong side out so I can draw on the back side. And I am cutting this carrot on the fold because I do want to sew this together so that we can put a little stuffing in it. So I'm cutting it on or drawing it onto the back of the fabric and then I will cut it on the fold. So place one side of your pattern on the fold and then go ahead and cut it out. And when you open it up, it's gonna look kind of like a heart with a funky little notch at the bottom. That's what it's supposed to look like because when we sew this together, it will look like a carrot. Before I take these to the sewing machine, I'm going to go ahead and press them all really well and then I will go ahead and sew these and I'm just going to do this off camera because I know y'all probably get tired of seeing me sew. It's kind of boring. You could also use glue to do this if you're not a sewer and you wanted to use glue to do this. Glue will work exactly the same as sewing. So to sew these together, I'm going to put right sides together on my carrots, and then I'm just going to sew all around that bottom edge, but I'm going to leave this top part open so that I can stuff these after they've been sewn. For the pockets, I wanted to have some cute stitching on these, so I'm drawing on, I'm, I'm basically just drawing on that same exact draw, uh, stitch marks that are on the actual pattern piece, and then I will take it to the sewing machine and just stitch around my drawing, my stitch around my drawing marks. <laughs> I hope that made sense. <laughs> I think you probably know where I was going with that. <laughs> Okay, so let's take these to the sewing machine and do all of our sewing. All right, we've sewn all of our pieces together and now I'm going to go ahead and 
turn my, oh, I think the pockets turned out so cute. You can kind of see how I just did the stitch mark on that to kind of give it that cute little pocket look to it. I just wanted it to look more like a pocket than just a patch. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn our carrots right sides out. And I'm just going to flip them the best I can by hand. And then I will use a crochet hook to kind of poke out that really skinny end, the pointy part of our carrot. Just be really careful when you do this part. You could use any blunt, any, anything that's blunt at the bottom to do this. You just want to be careful to, so that you don't poke through your stitching. All right, now that that's done, we can go ahead and put a little tiny bit of stuffing in each of the carrots. And I'm only going to stuff these about two thirds of the way full because I'm going to add some cute little greenery to the top of these and then tie it closed. get to embellishing this bunny shall we so the first thing I'm going to do is attach our cute little pocket right to our bunny's little belly area I guess you could say but when I glue this down I want to make sure that I get a little bit of a pucker in there so I'm going to put the hot glue on I'm just using hot glue but you could use fabric glue wood glue uh, um, like all-purpose glue you could use tacky glue any any kind of glue really is gonna work to do this but you know me and my hot glue I just use it for everything so, I'm, so I, even after I burn my fingers off. So I'm going to go ahead and place this back on, but before I stick it down, I'm gonna kind of poof it a little bit so that we get a little tiny bit of a pucker. So you can kind of see how I'm kind of pushing it into the center so that our pocket kind of puckers up in the middle. Kind of, It kind of makes it look like it's got something in it, I guess. It kind of gives it that full quilted look almost. Now I want to create some whiskers for this little guy. And I am just using some very, very thin wire to do this. I forgot what gauge this was, but I'll have it listed for y'all in um, the supply list in the description box. But it is a very thin wire. And I just cut a small, short length of it. And then I wrapped it around my paintbrush to kind of give it some curly cues. And then I'm going to just go ahead and hot glue these into place. And I am using six of them. So I'll have three whiskers on each side. And then once I get the whiskers gl glued into place, we will go ahead and glue on his cute little nose. nose I just used a little heart cut out that I cut out on the laser cutter um, but you could use any little heart to do this and then I just put it upside down I just I, I think an upside down heart looks exactly like a bunny nose <laughs> we used to my daughter used to raise rabbits and I used to say that all the time that their noses look just like an upside down heart so that's why I did it this way all right let's go ahead and add a little bit of greenery to our carrots and I am just using some boxwood that I just picked off of a larger piece of greenery pick and I'm tucking it down in there. I did use a little bit of hot glue to just kind of help secure it into place and then I'm going to go ahead and tie this closed with a really thin piece of jute and I'll just tie it in a cute little knot and then I instead of tying a bow I'm just going to leave the little um, tail ends hanging down with the knot because I kind of like that look for this particular piece. thought it would be cute to add a little dragonfly embellishment to our bunny so I'm going to use one the one of our ones that we created way back at the beginning of this video out of the resin and I'm just going to glue it right here just kind of below the pocket 
right around like almost on top of his foot I guess you could say and then right above the dragonfly I'm going to hot glue a little flower into place let's go ahead and tuck our carrots into his pocket or her pocket this could be a him or a her <laughs> and then I'm going to on top of the carrots I'm going to add in just this cute little wood bunny that I cut out on the laser cutter y'all I'm really enjoying the laser cutter I used to cut all this stuff out on my scroll saw and little things like this cute little bunny oh my gosh I can't it's so much easier with the laser cutter <laughs> and it's a lot faster and you get super precise cuts I love that so I am really enjoying the laser cutter all right we've got all his little cute embellishments tucked into his pocket so let's go ahead and create a bow and I'm going to make a pinwheel bow here so I've just taken some strips of fabric that I ripped I didn't cut them I just kind of ripped them and then I'm just going to go ahead and start laying them all out in this like pinwheel fashion and once I get them all laid out to the thickness that I want I'm going to tie it all together with a piece of jute To tie this together, I pick my pinwheel up the best I can without it moving, and then I'm gonna lay this center right on top of that piece of jute, and then just come up right through all of those little fabric pieces and tie it into a knot. And your bow will try to squish up. As you can see, it happened here. It will squish up like this, but once you get that first initial to not tied in there you can kind of fluff it up a little bit and then go ahead and tie a couple extra knots to make sure that this is really well securely held into place and then you can go ahead and fluff it up again and it will fluff right back out into that cute little pinwheel circle shape that we had and then if you want you can come in and trim up some of these ends I felt like mine was just a little bit too big so I am going to trim a little bit off the ends before we attach it to our bunny So to attach the bow to our bunny, I'm just going to use some hot glue and I'm attaching him to his ear. And in hindsight, I kind of wish that I would have attached this bow over on his left ear because I feel like the embellishments are a little heavy on the right side. A little top heavy, if you will. But once he was glued into place, it was not coming back up. So I just left it and went ahead and just fluffed everything up a little bit. And I think it's looking really, really cute. I did decide though that we needed a little extra something on the left side. So I came in with just a little tiny bumblebee and hot glued it to that left side of the pocket. Of course, after I finished fluffing everything up here, <laughs> that took a little while. Okay, y'all, so I'm gonna add one last embellishment to our cute little bunny and that is going to finish him off. I do think it is so darling. I think he would be really cute sitting on a shelf. What do you guys think of this sweet little bunny? Coming in at number five are these whimsical, cheerful candles we made during Valentine's. Y'all, these definitely deserve to be among my top five spring faves. They turned out just darling, and we had so much fun getting creative with these. Here's how we did it. Okay, y'all, so for today's projects, we are going to be using several of these cute little silicone molds that I have here, and I will have the link to all of these molds listed in the description box for y'all, and they are also available on my website. Okay, so we're going to be using this really cute ice cream scoop mold, this cookie mold. This cookie mold can be used for sugar cookies. You could use it to make uh, chocolate chip cookies or... Oh, the sky's the limit, I think. You could use this to make any kind of cookie. And then we've got some cute little snickerdoodles. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> 
sometimes my brain, I tell you. Then we've got this cute little rose. We've got some fun conversation hearts, these cute little envelopes. I've also got just some regular hearts that we'll be using. And then we've got this fun mold to make macaroons. So we'll be using that as well. And then I've got these berry ones. This is a blueberry and this is a raspberry because we're going to be making some cute little ice cream sundae candles. So these are all the molds. And don't forget, I will have the link to all of these listed in my description box for you. Okay, guys, let's get started. The first thing that we need to do to get started with our candles is gather up some supplies. We've already got all of our molds together, but now we need to get our candle wax and our melting pots all gathered. And for these molds, I'm gonna be using these teeny weeny tiny little um, melting pots. And I do have a big pot on my burner on a low, low temperature that's already got a whole bunch of melted wax so that I can just transfer from the big pot to my little pots. I just think that's gonna be the easiest way to go forward with this project. So now I've got some wax into my pots and my wax right now is at about 150 degrees and I am using Soey wax for all of our candles today. So at about 150, I can go ahead and add the coloring and then my scent. And for this one, I'm using a chocolate. It's Coke, it's called Cocoa, and it smells very chocolatey, like a true chocolate. Oh, it's so delicious. I wish y'all could smell this because it definitely makes me want chocolate. <laughs> So after I get the scent and the coloring into my wax here, I'm just going to give them all a really good stir. And I'm gonna go ahead and mix up two of these or maybe even three so that I just have them because I wanna do some different colors in our molds here. So here I think I'm just doing a blueberry one, or no, no, I did a fruity one and made it an orange color. So I'm going to go ahead and start filling up our little ice cream cone or our ice cream scoop molds here. And oh my gosh, y'all, I love these molds. I think they are just so fun. I can't wait to see how these turn out. So I had just enough wax um, in my little mini pot here to fill up two of our ice cream scoops. So with the remainder of the wax, I'm going to start filling some of our smaller molds because we don't want any of that wax to go to waste. So with this particular one, I'm just going to start making some of these cute little envelopes. And then with my second color here, which is actually blueberry, I thought it was fruity, but it is a blueberry. So I used blueberry cobbler scent for these ones. And I'm going to go ahead and pour some blueberries and then we'll pour into the raspberry mold, but we're going to make them blackberries. <laughs> and these molds, y'all, oh my gosh, they're so tiny and you have to pour so slow and so carefully as to not overflow the mold. So an idea that I did have, if you are struggling to pour your wax into this teeny tiny mold, because it does take a pretty steady hand, which I don't normally have, so I'm actually kind of surprised at myself that I pulled this off so smoothly. But you could use an eyedropper to do this. Just squeeze some wax into your eyedropper and then that might help you pour it more easily into the mold. So I'm going to go ahead with some of my excess wax here and start filling up some of these macaroons. I'm kind of excited to see how these ones are gonna look when we demold them as well. And then, because I still had some excess wax and we're not going to waste anything, I'm going to start filling up some of these mini, mini hearts in this little mini heart mold so we can make some tiny little mini heart wax melts. Here I've gone ahead and mixed a third color to make a couple more just fun fruity ice cream scoop flavor. So I'm just filling up a few more of these ice cream scoop molds here with some different colors. And then I thought, because I had, again, a little extra, it's really hard to measure the wax precisely when you're working with molds like this, which is why I keep some just kind of on the, keep some wax 
continuously melt it on my burner and then I can come in with these smaller pots and just fill them and it kind of does help eliminate some waste but I had that flower mold too so I made some flowers and now I've got another color that we're going to go ahead and fill up some of these cute little conversation heart molds one thing I did want to mention to y'all as well is that before I pour my wax, I do make sure that it is cooled to about 125 to 100 degrees. If you pour it too hot, you get sinking and some sink holes and divots in your wax, and we don't want that. Okay, y'all, so for the last mold here, I'm going to make a chocolate chip cookie. So I've put some little tiny round wax melts in the bottom, and then I'll just fill this cookie mold, and then we can move on to demolding these, which I am so excited about, y'all. This part has me just excited because I have a feeling this is going to be so satisfying. So the first thing we're going to do is demold our blueberries. And oh my gosh, already right out of the gate, I just think these are going to be so darling. Okay, can we just take a moment to appreciate the satisfaction here? Oh gosh, y'all, look how cute these are. It is amazing to me how intricate these molds are. I, I mean, I don't even know how they are made, but it is amazing me, amazing to me how intricate. I mean, these really truly did look like little blueberries. I do wish the color would have been just a little bit deeper. So that's something to keep in mind as well is I probably could have added a little bit more colorant to my wax to get a little more deeper purple, but oh gosh, look at the raspberries. Oh, they are turn or well, blackberries in this case, but they're turning out just as cute. Aren't these just darling? I'm really excited to use these to embellish some of our candles. So we're going to make some ice cream sundaes in just a little bit with some of our candles and these will be perfect for that. But you could also package these really cute and just use them for wax melts. So here is the flowers. This is the white ones that I poured and these ones didn't come out quite as quite as good as I wanted them to. The mold on this was really shallow and they just didn't turn out quite as good. However, our roses, these turned out absolutely gorgeous. Look at the detail in this. I think these turned out absolutely beautiful. I really love the roses and I kind of wish that I would have poured a whole bunch more of these, but I actually only poured just these three. So next time I make candles, I will definitely be sure and make more of the roses because they really did turn out beautiful. All right, let's demold our hearts now. <laughs> Demolding our hearts, that did sound a little bit funny. <laughs> Oh, I think these turned out absolutely darling too. And I love that we have a really big variety of colors for these. I have such a fun idea for our little hearts. We're going to use some in our bigger ice cream sundae candles, but then I also have a fun way that we can package these to give as gifts later. Let's demold our conversation hearts now. And oh gosh, y'all, these are so cute. Look how cute. Look how perfectly detailed the little lettering on these is. I'm just amazed at this. This just really amazes me. These molds are a fantastic invention. And there's so many different things you could do with these. I love this so much. I, I, these molds are just, I'm having too much fun. This has just been a super fun project for me. I think our little envelopes have turned out darling as well. I know I keep saying that y'all, but they're all just making me feel so happy. This is just such a satisfying part of this project. The only weird thing that happened here with my little envelopes is some of the pigmentation from the uh, color, the colorant that I used separated in some of these and it gave it just a weird look. But then at the end of the day, I was kind of like, oh, well that's all right because it just kind of makes them look a little bit more vintage and aged. 
Okay, so now we can demold our macaroons. And while we are demolding these, I do want to just take a second to let y'all know that after I poured every single one of these molds, I let all of these set up. Some of them took about six to eight hours and some of them took about 12 to 14 hours. So I just kind of poured all of them in one day and then let them set overnight. So this is the next day that I am demolding all of these. All right, so the macaroons were a little bit disappointing to me. I feel like they needed multiple colors. And so we'll, we're just, we're just going to go with what we have. But now let's talk about these ice cream scoops. Oh my gosh, y'all. These are amazing. I am, I am floored here. I, this, this has just got me feeling so excited. They truly do look like a real ice cream scoop. The texture in this is just amazing. This is so fun for me and I cannot wait to use these to embellish some of our candles. Coming in at number four are these charming bird cages that we made. I love the simplicity as well as their versatility. These little cuties look great on their own or they can be styled with your favorite embellishments. Here's how we made them. I am really excited about this project, y'all. I'm going to show you how I made this cute little birdcage cloche <laughs> decor piece. I, I'm not actually sure what I want to call this. It mimics more like a birdcage, I suppose, so we'll just call it a cute little mini birdcage. So we're going to need some wire, and I'm using 12-gauge wire. We're going to need some of these little tart, mini tart pans, some floral foam, some uh, wire cutters, and a wooden finial for the topper. So we're going to get started by first forming our floral foam to the tart tin. And I'm just going to do this by pressing it right into that um, foam. And that piece was a little bit <laughs> too big. So I, I had this spare one left from the first one that I created. So I'm just going to press it right onto that foam to let that foam kind of form to the shape of the little tart pan. And I am using, this particular foam is a dry wet foam. And I like this one for two reasons, because I like the color of it. I like that just that earthy deep green color, but I also like that it's very moldable. So I just kind of use my fingers to mold this to the shape of the tart pan. Once I am satisfied that I've got it shaped exactly the way I want it and it fits nice and snug in there, I'm going to go ahead and hot glue this right into the tart pan. And y'all be careful, I burnt my finger really bad doing this. I'm not even sure how I did it. Somehow I got some glue on my finger and it burnt. And <laughs> oh boy, does it smart. <laughs> Look at that, it's blistering already. Goodness, yeah, so be careful with hot glue guns. They can be dangerous, but yet I can't seem to live without mine. So anyway, so I went ahead and hot glued this in. That's another reason why I like this floral foam is it works really well with hot glue and I never have issues with the hot glue actually melting the foam. Yeah, look at my finger. I really did a good job on that, didn't I? <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead and start forming our wire. And I didn't have anything in the kitchen that had this nice straight shape to it. So I just grabbed a wine bottle out of my, um, my wine collection and used that to shape the foam or to shape the wire. So because I want a nice curve at the top of that. And then once I kind of shape it around that, I fiddle with it a little bit to just kind of, you know, shape it even a little bit more. And then I do want to make sure that all of them are a, roughly the same length. So I did trim the bottoms off to try to get them as close to the same length as I could. Next, we're just going to go ahead and place them into our little floral foam. And I do this by placing one and then I go over the opposite direction and then I come over across those with that third piece. And after I got these set and kind of shaped the way I wanted, I did dip the ends of all of these wires into some hot glues and just sort of pressed them into that floral foam to get them a good secure hold. I 
did fiddle with this a little bit too after I glued them into place just to kind of reshape them and get them looking exactly the way I wanted. And then to secure them at the top, I'm just going to come in with a very thin piece of jute and tie them securely together with a really tight knot. Then of course I will just come in and trim up all of those tail ends or my two tail ends not all <laughs> there's all of two <laughs> the two tail ends and I clipped them very close to that knot and that way I don't have a big bulky knot at the top because we do want to um, glue our finial to the very top of this all right so I'm gonna fuss with this just a little bit more to kind of shape things and get the shape spruced up a little bit after you tie the strings they do tend to kind of move a little bit and some of them started to bend weird on me I didn't have that issue with the first one I made but with this one I don't know what I don't know why I was having issues <laughs> but I was anyway you know craft projects are like that right some go super smooth and some don't. Okay, y'all, so I'm just going to go ahead and start layering in some moss here. And I'm using three different types of moss. And I do hot glue it down. And here I am being super stupid again. <laughs> And then I'm like, oh yeah, don't do that. Don't burn yourself again. So I grabbed these, um, my needle nose pliers, but that wasn't working so well. So I will actually go and grab my the proper tool for doing this so that I don't burn any more fingers. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep layering in some moss here until I have it looking pretty full. And I do kind of want it to have a little bit of that messy um, look to it so that it looks, you know, like a bird actually did build this nest. I mean, bird nests are usually super precise, but kind of messy at the same time, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the look that I was going here with this moss. Now that we have all of our moss in and I like the way it looks, it's looking pretty good and full and I've covered up all of the floral foam, we can go ahead and now add the finial to the top and I'm just using some um, hot glue to do this and I do just, I press it on as close to the center of, of those wires as I possibly can and then I hold it for a few minutes just to let that hot glue completely set so that the finial will stay in place. And then I felt like, oh, I think I want to add a little bit of moss to the top of this up around the finial. So I'm just going to go ahead and hot glue just some little bits of moss around the tip top too. It's just kind of peeking out. All right, y'all, so now we can go ahead and embellish our cute little bird cage that we created here, or in this instance, it's gonna be a rabbit cage. <laughs> Cause I want to add in the um, rabbit that we created earlier today. I just thought this would be super cute. So I am going to hot glue him into place, and I did use a pretty liberal amount of hot glue here. I wanna make sure that this little guy isn't gonna go anywhere. And after I get him all situated and placed the way I like, I'm going to come in with a few more embellishments. <laughs> Are y'all keeping track of how many times I use the word embellishments? <laughs> I know it's a lot. So anyway, I'm going to add a few more embellishments to this. I think we will go ahead and tuck in a little mushroom, a little flower, and a carrot. <laughs> Once we get the carrot all tucked into place, that is going to finish off this project. And y'all, I think these are really, really cute. I think you could use these for so many different things. And obviously they would also look really cute with a sweet little bird tucked inside. What do y'all think of this? I think that this little guy is pretty cute tucked in here. And then I just added an Easter egg to the other one because I was just kind of playing around and wanted to see what kind of filler we could use. 
Coming in at number three is this unique art piece we created together. I love to try things that are just a little out of the ordinary and this piece did not disappoint. I love how it turned out and have enjoyed it styled atop the mantle. And it pairs so nicely with all of my spring favorites. Here's how we made it. All right, y'all, for this project, we are going to have some fun. So we will need a canvas. For this one, I'm using a 16 by 14 or 14 by 16 canvas. You will also need a stencil and some transfer tape. And I will provide the pattern for this stencil in the description box for y'all. And then we are going to have some fun with Crackle Medium. I don't know if y'all have ever used Crackle Medium, but this stuff is a lot of fun. So we're going to play with that a little bit. And then you will need a variety of paint colors for this project and I will have all of the colors that I used for this piece listed in the description box for y'all. So to get started we are first going to paint our entire canvas and I am using country twill folk art country twill to paint the canvas and I do paint the entire surface the fronts and the sides. For this next step, we are going to have a little bit of fun and just play around with some artistic style. And this is where one of those places where you just get to do you. We're going to use several colors. And what we're going to do here is create this really fun backdrop, so to speak. So we're going to create this canvas to look very similar to an antique photo or an antique piece of wallpaper. That might be the better way to say this. So the first thing I'm going to do is water down my paint. So I start with my first color and I water it down a little bit because I want this to have a little bit of that watercolor effect. And all I'm going to do here is just start drawing some leaves and I'm just freehanding these. This is just one of those places where you can just have a ton of fun with this and just do you and get as creative as you want with this step. If you are not comfortable free handing all of your leaves or flowers or whatever it is you choose to choose for your background, you could use stencils to do this step as well. That would be just as easy and just as much fun. So here I'm just going to continue drawing on a whole bunch of my leaves or painting on a whole bunch of my leaves. And then I will come back in after I get my initial layer I am leaving a little bit of a blank space in the center because that's where we're going to put a bird in a little bit. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue layering in some flowers. And then I will come in with a little bit of a darker color and create a second layer of leaves here. And I'm also watering down this color. I'm going to water down all of my paints for this step because I, again, I'm trying to achieve a little bit of that watercolor effect. So I'm going to just kind of start overlaying. So I'm going to not completely overlay each of the initial leaves that I drew here, but just a little bit. So you can kind of see what I mean. I'm just sort of overlaying them off to the edge a little bit to create sort of a shadow, I guess you could say, with that darker green. Once I feel good about the initial leaves that I have down, I'm going to come in and just start adding in some little, I don't know what you want to call these, like just little uh, swishy marks. <laughs> and I'm just going to do that. 
to fill this space in because I kind of want a nice filled in space behind our bird that we're going to create in just a little bit. And I also come in with the end of my paintbrush and create a whole bunch of dots to kind of resemble like berries or just a little bit of filler. This is actually really just adding some filler into my background. Now that we have the background in place and completed, I'm happy with it. I love the way it's looking. We're going to start aging this piece. So the first thing that I'm going to do to give this a little aging is come back in with our initial color. This is the color that I first laid on the canvas, that country twill. But this time I'm watering it down a lot because we just want to create like a wash here. And then I'm going to just brush that wash over the top of our entire canvas. And what this is going to do is to sort of make our background look a little dimensional. It's going to kind of put it in the background a little bit more and look at, give it that faded look. So I've washed most of this canvas, but I did want to show you here the difference between the wash side and the side that hasn't been washed. And you can see the difference, how it just gives it that subtle look. It kind of just really puts it in the background and makes it look more watercolory. So this next step is where we're going to start bringing in some of the aging and I am just using some antiquing wax to do this and a good stippling brush. I'm going to put dip my brush into the antiquing wax and then dab a whole bunch of it off onto my paper towel because you really just want to do a dry brushing here. But I am going to go over the entire canvas with this, but I'm going to do it very light. I'm using a very light hand here, a very gentle hand here. And if you get some places that are a little bit darker than you want them to be, just come back in with a little bit of that wash and cover it up and then use your dry brush to do some blending. And then to give this piece a little extra aging, I'm going to use a little darker antiquing wax on my brush and brush all of the edges. And to do this, I kind of start from the inside of my canvas and work outward. And then I come back in and work from the outside of my canvas and work inward to just give us some of those really fun brush strokes. Okay, so now we can go ahead and lay down our stencil. So I'm just going to place the stencil on my canvas here, work, do my best to get it centered and positioned the way that I want it. Then I had to come in with, I got it laid down, but because you know it's canvas that we're working with and it's a little bit flimsy, I can't, I put a book behind it to just give it a little extra surface to really make sure that my stencil is really well adhered to the canvas. Once we get our stencil adhered to the canvas, we can go ahead and remove our carrier paper. This is like the transfer tape. And I do this slowly. You wanna make sure you do this slowly because some of my vinyl did try to come up with the carrier paper. And then I just take my finger and brush all around the outside of our stencil to make sure it's really well adhered because you don't wanna get any bleed when you do this. Now we're going to go ahead and stencil this on. And I am using a stenciling brush with some black chalk paint and a pouncy motion. So when you are using a stencil, the best way to get a good coverage without bleed is to use a pouncy motion. If you do a brush, you run the risk of getting the paint up underneath your stencil and then you might get some bleed through. Okay, so now we have let our stencil coat, our first initial stencil coat completely dry. So now we can come in and have some fun with this crackle medium. So I'm going to go ahead and lay a really liberal coat of this down because I want really large cracks in our paint. And then I will come in and just kind of smooth it out with my brush. You do want to use a flat brush, a, a soft flat brush to do this and kind of work in 
one fluid motion as you're doing this. And then we will let that crackle medium dry for about two hours. So here I've let it dry and I did just a little bit of a test swatch and it's looking really good. So now we can go ahead and come in with our top coat. So when working with crackle medium, you want your undercoat to be darker than your top coat so that you get that nice contrast because this is going to create cracks in the paint and you want those cracks to have a darker color. So now I'm laying down the top coat of this and you do want to make sure that you don't do back and forth motions. You just want to go one stroke, one direction as you're laying this down and you want to use a pretty thick coat of paint to do this. Once you have your top coat on, I suggest letting it dry pretty good before you try to remove the stencil. I was impatient and started lifting my stencil way too soon and I did have a little bit of trouble. It worked out okay in the end, but I do recommend letting your paint dry completely before removing the stencil. And another trick that I did was I removed my stencil in small pieces. So I did kind of use some scissors to cut some of the pieces to just give me some small pieces to remove at a time. I do think the most satisfying part of this project is removing the stencil. This was a fun part for me, it was very satisfying. Once I got the stencil removed, I was so happy with the results. The only thing I wish I would have done differently is put antiquing wax for my first base coat rather than the black. Coming in at number two are these quirky art pieces we created in my most recent episode. These were just plain fun to make. I love them and have enjoyed them in the studio so very much. Here's how we made them. Alrighty, so I've gone ahead and mixed up our moody color palette and y'all, I'm actually loving this one. This might be my favorite color palette of them all. It was probably the easiest one for me to mix mostly because I already had a lot of these colors these base colors in my arsenal so this one was pretty easy to mix up and again don't forget I will have all of the mixology to these paint this these paint palettes available for y'all as part of the free art bundle. So now we're just going to go ahead and have some fun splashing these paints onto our canvas. I'm just going to throw some paint down, have fun, create different shapes, create different size lines, get scratchy with your paint, just have fun. I mean, really, honestly, y'all, this is supposed to just be a super fun project. And I don't want y'all to put a lot of pressure on yourself to get everything perfect. This is just a fun, fun, fun project. I just decided it might be kind of fun to play with my stippling brush a little bit and so I just pulled that out dabbed some of the paint color on it and then I dabbed some of it off sort of like that to get that dry brush effect and I thought it added a lot to this it was kind of fun it just gave it some depth and some dimension so one thing I want to let y'all know if you are just not comfortable trying this or it's just not your thing you don't want to do it but you like the end result I will have all of these available for you as a printable as well. Just the color, just my color swatches here. I will have those available. They will be part of your free art bundle. Okay, so we've got the moody done. This one, I think I got spot on. I really do feel like this one is super close to our sample palette and I really like it. This one is fun. I love this color palette. It's It really does describe 
the color palette that I am loving this year. And I've really gravitated towards this color palette and I've been using it in a lot of places throughout my home. Okay, so now let's just work on the next one. We're gonna work on this one that's the Serene color palette. I also really love this one. This one, there was just something about this color palette that just gave me those happy, calm vibes. Very similar to the first one that we created. The very last color palette that we're going to play with together is the Sassy palette. And y'all, this is a super fun palette. I actually think it would be fun to incorporate these into a room. I just think this is so much fun. These, they're, they're just super playful colors. I will tell you though, that these ones were the hardest for me to blend up. I really struggled with this one. And so in full disclosure and full transparency, I had to redo a lot of these multiple times to get the color tones just right. So if you do decide to recreate this color palette for yourself, just remember to give yourself lots of grace and be patient with yourself because it does take some time to get these color tones exact. <laughs> but I think we nailed it in the end. After all that hard work, it was definitely worth it because I do love that color palette. All right, so let's start assembling these now. All I'm going to do is just stick some, this is double-sided tape. I just buy these, these double-sided tape wheels in the crafty section at Walmart actually. And I think I've seen them at Michael's and Hobby Lobby's too. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stick these to some fun background colors. And this is just some card stock that I found. It came in a bundle that I got at Hobby Lobby and I will try to have it linked in the description box for y'all if I can. So I'm just gonna center this as close to center as I possibly can. I really am just eyeballing this. And then we will glue our lettering onto this and I'm just gonna use some super glue to do the lettering. Then we'll pop it in our frame and we will have a fun completed gallery wall with just lots of fun color palettes. I really love this project in the end. I think it turned out fabulous and I'm really going to enjoy this so much in the studio. Y'all will have to let me know which of these color palettes, which of the six color palettes is your favorite. I had a really hard time choosing because honestly, I love them all. I think the Moody is my number one favorite, but I really like this Sassy as well. It's just so much fun. And finally, coming in at number one are these absolutely darling resin birds we made earlier this spring. Y'all, these are hands down one of my favorite projects we've made this season. I love them and have not grown tired of them on the mantle. Here's how we made them. I am so excited about this project, y'all. I have been super into resin and molds lately so this is going to be a fun one we are going to create our own little ceramic they're going to be resin but we're going to call them ceramic birds so we're going to need some casting resin some measuring cups some stirring spoons and of course the mold and i will have this mold listed in the description box for y'all if you want to recreate these darling little birds so we're going to go ahead and start by mixing our two parts this resin is a quick set re quick set resin and it comes in two parts you have part a part b and we are going to need 60 milliliters of resin to fill this specific mold so i'm going to pour 30 milliliters of part a and then we will fill 30 milliliters of part b we will stir it really well when you first mix them together they're going to be a little foggy you're going to want to stir these really well until it sort of becomes clear and that's when you know it's ready to pour If y'all ever get confused on the mixology for this particular resin kit, it is literally just a one-to-one -one ratio. So for example, the mold that we're using today is a, it holds 60 milliliters. So we're going to do 30 milliliters of part A, 30 milliliters of part B. We have now mixed it thoroughly and it is ready to pour into the mold. Okay, y'all, so 
when doing this part, you do want to mix or not mix, pour. We've already mixed, <laughs> but you do want to pour very slowly. Two reasons. If you pour slowly, you don't run the risk of overflowing and pouring slowly also eliminates bubbles. But because this is a 3D mold, I am going to come in and sort of tap the mold all the way around to help eliminate some bubbles that we may get in our finished product. This is after 15 minutes, y'all. This stuff sets up so fast and I love it. And you know it's completely set up when it turns from clear to opaque white. And it was a little fiddly getting it out of the mold, but not too much. You can kind of see here, I popped it out pretty easily. <laughs> it did kind of make me giggle a little because it was almost like watching an egg or a bird hatch from an egg. All right, so now we have our cute little bird and oh my gosh, y'all. This just makes me feel giddy. I love this. I love being able to pour some resin in a mold and then just like that, get a little bird that we're going to kind of turn into a bird that looks very ceramic. So I'm going to go ahead and repeat that entire process to create a second bird. And here we are demolding the second one. This one, you know, cause it, were, it went a little bit faster than the first one because I had had a little more practice. So something to think about when you are using this particular resin, it is ready to demold after about 10 to 15 minutes. However, it does take about 12 hours for it to completely and fully set. So when you first demold them, parts of your mold, like the tail on this particular bird, because it's a little thinner, was a little soft. But after 12 hours, it completely set and no worries. So now we are ready to to start painting and I'm just going to come in and do a base coat on these and I am using some slate gray to paint just a base coat all over this. This particular resin is paintable and it paints very, very well. I will have all of the colors that I used to create this cute little bird listed in the description box for y'all. Okay, so now we have the base coat, that gray base coat down on each of the birds. And while that base coat is just a little bit wet, not super wet, but a little bit wet, I come in with some green and gently brush it on to just kind of blend that green into the gray a little bit. Okay, y'all, so we have alleged that those first two coats dry. Our initial gray and our green blend have dried. And so now what I'm going to do is start coming in with a whole lot of layers. The look that I'm going for here is sort of an aged patinaed look. So to, to achieve that, we definitely need to work in lots and lots of layers. Some of the layers I do let fully dry and some of them we work a little bit, you know, like wet on wet, so to speak, like you would like if you were water coloring, for example. So here I've come in and layered on a little bit of dark green and then I came in with a little chocolate color while that dark green was still slightly wet. And I am using a dry brush here. So I dab my brush into the paint, wipe it off on the paper towel, and then use that to just kind of blend the colors together. And I continue doing this, layering on, and you can kind of see the difference here. We've, we've got a lot of depth and a lot of dimension happening so far, so far, but I wanna keep adding to this. So now I'm coming in with a little bit of vintage blue because you want those undertones of blue on this, and we want a little bit of undertones of pinks and greens on our cute little bird here. So again, I just keep layering on, layering on, and making sure I'm dry brushing and blending everything really well. So after I've let all those first initial coats dry, I decided we needed a little more pop of color. So I came in with kind of a really light celery green here, and I'm going over everything with that. And then again, I will come on top of that and do a little bit more layering. Mm -hmm. 
Here we have our birds pretty well finished and I'm really loving how these turned out. They definitely have that very aged patina look to them. So now it's time to create some cute little nests for them. So I'm going to start by using some candlesticks, this cute little bowl that I found at Hobby Lobby that kind of looks like a bird's nest in and of itself. And then I did find these really cute uh, grapevine bird's nests that were already preformed. I found these at Hobby Lobby as well and we're going to use some of this fun moss and a little bit of florals. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just flip this one candlestick upside down. I want a little bit of height between these two because these candlesticks were the same height. So to create a variation in heights I add the bowl to the top of one of them, put in the nest, and then I'm going to go ahead and do the same to the shorter one, add the nest, and then to fill the nest, I will add in a little bit of moss. Then we can set the bird in there, kind of see what things are looking like. And then if we need a little bit more, we can come in with some florals. I feel like our nests are looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and tuck our birds in and just see how they set in here and how they are looking. And so far, I am loving the way this looks. I do feel like, though, we need to add just a pop of floral to this. I don't know if birds actually use flowers to build their nests, but I kind of like the look. So I'm just going to take some of this baby's breath and cut a few sprigs off and tuck it just here and there into the nests. All right, y'all, I think that is going to finish off our cute little birds. I love the way they turned out and it's going to be fun to style them with all the pieces that we create today. I look so forward to seeing y'all next week. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your day to come and hang with me. Y'all are the absolute best. I cannot wait to see you again next week. Until then, take care and I will see you soon. Bye friends.